coordinator for the Waukesha County Green Team. If this is your first time coming to one of our presentations, I want to uh, give you just a little bit of background about us. Uh, we are a volunteer-based nonprofit. We are located in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, if you are not in this area, Waukesha is located um, the county over from Milwaukee, kind of in the southeastern portion of Wisconsin. Um, so our uh, organization is really focused on promoting environmental and economic sustainability in Waukesha County communities. And we do that through education, collaboration, and local action. So we work with residents, businesses, schools, municipalities, and different organizations. And we're really excited to gather all of you here with us tonight. Um, this presentation is sponsored by our permaculture and gardening group. So we have this really thriving group of residents of Waukesha County who are passionate about permaculture and gardening and uh, learning about how they can incorporate those ideas into their landscapes, their gardens, and their homes. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the permaculture and gardening group, uh, I will send out a link with their contact information um, in that email that I'll send out tomorrow. So real quickly, I don't wanna move on without plugging the uh, Waukesha County Green Team's big event coming up in August. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a flyer to our sustainability fair. It's on August 28th at Retzer Nature Center. So this day long event is just jam packed full of presentations, exhibitors, uh, hands on demonstrations. There's an electric vehicle showcase, a permaculture and gardening village that you can walk through and learn about all sorts of different things. Planetarium shows, food trucks, Cole's Wild Theater, presentation and we are super excited to announce that Melinda Myers will be joining us for a presentation and a garden walk. Uh, her presentation is entitled Creating a Garden with Year-Round Beauty and Pollinator Appeal and we are um, very thankful it is sponsored by American Transmission Company and Grow Smart. So if any of you are interested in attending that sustainability fair, it is August 28th at Retzer. It is a free event. So you can come, bring your family, bring your friends. Um, and I will drop a link to more information about that right into the chat. All right, so without any further ado, um, tonight's presentation, we're gonna ask everyone to stay muted. And Jim's requested that you have your videos on if it's appropriate. So he can, he likes to see faces as he's talking, which is great. And if you have questions, and we hope you have a ton of questions, that's what we're here for, you can type them right into the chat. Um, we're gonna stop and have a point about midway through where Jim will answer some questions. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll answer some more. All right, so tonight, we want to welcome crop and soil expert, Jim Studi. Hi, Jim. You want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, thank you all for, um, for coming tonight. I know there's some distractions out there. Once again, it hasn't rained, so the garden's dry enough to work in. And the all-star game's on tonight. And I, quite frankly, woke up in a panic this morning thinking that the Bucks game was tonight. And thankfully, it's tomorrow night. And apparently, according to the meteorologists, the uh, gathering of hundreds of thousands of people in downtown Milwaukee who don't have seats inside is going to prompt a very high probability of rainfall. So let's hope that the meteorologists are right, because we really need rain. And that's all I'm going to say about the drought. So again, Jim Studi, um, I identify myself mostly these days as a farmer. I'm in Walworth County. And if I was referencing um, Waukesha County on the map, I'd say, yeah, Waukesha County, it's not west of Milwaukee, even though it is, but really it's northeast of uh, 
Walworth County, the cultural center of the upper Midwest. So by training, I'm a scientist. In my heart, I'm an educator. You're going to see UW Extension, uh, the UW Extension logo on some of my slides, mostly like my tattoo. I could not remove them. And so we're not gardening naked and I'm not presenting naked. So you wouldn't be able to see the tattoo anyway. But a lot of time spent with um, UW Extension and I still continue to do outreach work, mostly with um, the farmer led watershed groups that are in the uh, in the uh, southwest or southeast region of Wisconsin here, but always happy to talk with my friends at the uh, Waukesha, Waukesha County Green Team. So with that, what we're going to do tonight, when my slides advance. Great, it worked in, uh, in practice. So four general areas of our, our topics of uh, cover crops in the home garden. The first two of them, the role of cover crops in creating the healthy soil and management considerations um, kind of set the stage for the hands-on discussion of what we're gonna do with cover crops in the home garden. So a little bit of this is review material for those of you that were at our soil health talk a couple of months ago. Um, but good to talk about in the context of, of cover cropping in the home garden. And then we'll take a break, as Joanna said, and address any questions you had at that time. And then we're going to move ahead with applications and talk about cover crop culture. And please, if you have a burning question, uh, let her know and she can, she can stop me. I hope that's okay with you, Joanna. So you watch for that. So that's what we're going to do. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover tonight, and I can't cover everything that has to do with this uh, subject. So I've got some suggested reading. The first is a UW Extension um, publication, which I co-authored a couple of years ago, which is the basis for a lot of the information that I'm presenting tonight. That and the other resources are available for free uh, for download from the internet. Um, from UW Extension at the Learning Store site. So I heard Melinda Meyer's name, I know on her garden walk when she talks about references, she's gonna refer to the Learning Store site. A lot of great references there. Um, nationally from the USDA SARE program, Managing Cover Crops Profitably. Um, it's in its third edition. I've worked on this publication from its inception. It continues to be a really good uh, resource. Uh, even though it's um, national in scope, there's they've worked it out so that it's got a lot of regional information that's available at the SARE website. And then cover crops for the intensive market farm. That's also a Wisconsin publication written by John Hendrickson. And in its latest revision, and it was just revised, um, it also includes Claire Strader from... Um, uh, Dane County Extension, and the revision, I think, is really helpful. There's a lot of new information in there, and so that's uh, the CIS website on there. I did go specifically to the um, this publication. I stopped one step before that because they also have some case study information related to cover crops and fresh market uh, production, so I thought that may be useful and so I thought we'll just stop one step before, but it's listed right there. So then you can uh, you can download it from from that website. So with that, let's jump into it. Oh, well, first I thought we'd start with a little inspiration. Yeah, procrastination works for me, but you know what? We got a lot of hard work. So let's talk about about cover crops. So last time at the soil health discussion, we talked about the four principles, but I didn't package it, the four principles of the soil health, but I didn't package it as neatly as the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service does. So Natural Resources Conservation Service, that's NRCS. They are big on soil health. And down at the bottom is a link to, to a website where they've got a series of soil health fact sheets. But really they summarize it I think best, and it's really simple, four principles. Minimize disturbance of the soil. We talked about that last time. It doesn't have to be complete no-till, but just reduce the amount of disturbance. 
and that'll increase soil health. The next is to maximize soil cover, whether it's crop residue that's left on the surface or the addition of cover crops, we wanna maximize soil cover to protect against raindrop impact and the effect that that has on, um, on both compaction, but also on soil erosion and a loss of both, both soil and nutrients to erosion. The next is to maximize biodiversity. So on the farm, corn soybean rotation, we're not really maximizing our biodiversity. We do a much better job in the garden with the variety of crops that we plant and adding cover crops adds to that diversity. So just a single species that adds the diversity. If we plant a cover crop mix, which I'm gonna talk a lot about tonight, we're really gonna increase the, uh, the biodiversity. So cover crops are a way to increase biodiversity. And then fourthly, maximize continuous living roots. So why this is so important, many of our garden crops um, are only active rooting wise for, active rooting wise for a short period in the growing season. And why living roots are so important for soil health is that roots are really active in exuding compound containing carbons to stimulate the biological community. And it's a symbiotic relationship. So they do this intentionally. So 40 years ago, 40 years ago, when I was a young fresh faced student at UW Madison, we didn't talk about that. Later on in the late 80s and early 90s, when I got into graduate student, we talked about roots and how leaky they were. And they lose these carbon containing materials, which is totally inefficient to the plant. Well, we've subsequently learned that plants do that very intentionally. And the reason they do that is to create this symbiotic relationship. So they put energy into the soil and the soil, the soil microbes, the bacteria and the fungi, they use that carbon and they use it to break down other compounds. And in exchange for the energy, they release nitrogen, phosphorus and other compounds into the soil solution for the crops to take up. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. So the carbon from the crops and the living roots produces the carbon, sent it into the system, which keeps the, um, keeps the uh, microbes going, especially in the absence of fresh crop residue to break down. So that's a way to keep the biological community going. So it's really important and cover crops certainly can, can add to that earlier in the season before we plant our crops or later on in the season when our crops are are uh, dead and decaying. So why use cover crops in a home garden? So I mentioned um, some of the reasons. Gardening in particular is really hard on soil. We have season long traffic causing compaction. The other thing is we don't have season long um, crop canopy to protect the soil from raindrop impacts. So that also causes compaction. We also, because of the nature of our crops, they aren't always really competitive. So we rely on frequent tillage and in particular um, tillage for weed control. And that tillage, anytime we do tillage, it destroys, destroys soil structure. We also, because we've been listening to the soil health or the plant health experts, we often remove the residue of our crops uh, from a sanitation standpoint to reduce disease incident but that takes with it available nutrients, the organic matter that's there that the microbes can't break down. And because we've taken the food source away, we have reduced biological activity. Now, hopefully we're cycling that back through the compost bin and we can add that organic matter to the soil, but in the short term, it's gone. And so that really starves out the, the, uh, the microbes and unless we have the living cover crop there, to, um, to give the root exudates as a food source, really there's nothing for them to, um, to feed on. And so biological activity is gonna, gonna be reduced. So last time I talked about adding organic matter, um, the cover crops, we talked about uh, composting and crop residues and that kind of thing. And so I'm gonna pose a little question here to the group and I'm gonna answer it myself. Is adding that organic material enough? 
and I am coming to the conclusion based on my garden soil that no, it's not enough. So these are pictures from my garden taken this morning. Half of my garden, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, is in garden production. It's planted late, it's planted in the beginning of June. I was busy with other things and I thought, you know, it's really dry. I'm gonna to have to water that damn thing every night. Do I really wanna do that? Actually, I garden in the or water in the morning. And the reason is we don't want the wet plant foliage overnight because that, that just enhances its susceptibility to disease. So I water it in the, in the morning, but do I want to be doing that every morning? And then I started thinking about what I was watering and the answer is yes, Jim, you want to do it. So I planted late, it's an abbreviated garden and it's only half the garden. The other half, I am going to plant a cover crop, uh, summer mix, I've got the seed, um, I will talk about that once we get rainfall enough to guarantee that that the expense of the seed and the effort to plant it is going to um, provide results. I also have some pollinator habitat and I've been waiting for the rain. It's the same seed lot that are going into the pollinator habitat. So I'm preparing that ground for planting the pollinator habitat. Again, rain is, rain is the key thing. So this is what the, uh, what the soil looks like now. It's a big consolidated mass. I dug down a little bit. I do have the soil structure there and you can see it. There's a lot of good aggregation there, but there's also some really fine aggregation. And it's this fine aggregation that causes the compaction once we get the raindrop impact. And even with the minimal rain that we've had this year, we've had enough to compact the soil surface. I have been adding organic matter continually for years. I've cover cropped in the garden, not enough, it turns out, but I have added organic matter. I haven't kept record of it like I do on my, uh, like I do on my fields, but here's proof positive. This is a soil test result um, from a soil sample that I took uh, earlier this summer. I took it in, uh, in June. Actually, I took it in April. I got it submitted in June. When we first moved here in 1993, I took a soil test result. The soil test said phosphorus, potassium, pH, I'm all okay. So I did do it. I didn't think that I needed to worry about a soil test because quite frankly, I had enough P, I had enough P, enough K. I knew I was adding organic matter. And frankly, they're expensive and I don't really add a lot of extra phosphorus or potassium in the form of commercial forms. So why, why worry about it? Well, professionally, I was sending in a whole slew of um, soil tests, so I thought, why not just see what the result is. So here's the result. Go down to the bottom here. Organic matter, almost 4%. The rest of my farm, where I don't add the organic matter, I'm 1.9 to 2%. So that shows that I've increased organic matter. That's good. Look at the phosphorus, 285 parts per million. Look at the potassium, 660 parts per million. So for a functioning garden, I don't want this to, the phosphorus to be around 30. My mouse isn't working. Phosphorus in the neighborhood of 150. I'm, I'm 10 times what I need for phosphorus and the potassium. Where's all that coming from? All the organic matter that I've added over time. We're adding organic matter. Some of it's breaking down. What I'm thinking, is I need to ramp up the cover cropping, both for the impact with the carbon exudates on aggregation that we talked about last time, but also I need to think about mycorrhizal fungi in my soil. We need to increase their abundance through the uh, cover crop species that promote it, in particular forage legumes. So we can get glomalin, that's the water, insoluble glycoprotein that's produced by the mycorrhizae. We need that to glue these particles together so they're not breaking apart when it rains. So that's really my emphasis now in long-term management is more cover cropping, not as much just organic matter compost, compost addition. So 
In giving a talk, because I come from academia, I thought, well, let's start with a definition. I've worked in this field for 35 years. I struggle to come up with, with a definition. So I thought I'd borrow one. So I went to the two ultimate fonts of wisdom, Wikipedia, the first one. So I went to Wikipedia, Googled cover crop, typed in cover crop. What did I get? Any plant grown to improve any number of conditions associated with agriculture. What would Homer Simpson say? Don't, huh? What does that mean? I mean, Monsanto says that about Roundup. It really means nothing. You could say that about anything and uh, it doesn't really mean anything. So I went to the other font of wisdom, the Ohio State University. And actually I looked at several sources, but I like this one the best. A crop grown to benefit the soil and other crops but not intended for harvest. And really that hits the nail on the head. It addresses the soil plant system, starting with the soil, we're benefiting the soil, and then we're benefiting the crops it follows. This is like the perfect definition. So let's talk about cover crops and let's talk first about the soil benefits and then we'll talk about the bigger garden situation. So cover crops benefit the soil by protecting the soil surface when no crops are present. So it protects against the harmful impacts of rainfall impact. Their root impact improves soil physical properties. They break up compaction, the tight soil in the upper layer of the surface. That's where all the action is uh, from a rooting standpoint for a vegetable, also from a nutrient standpoint, but also for the deeper rooting um, structures. So all crops, like I said, top six inches from a nutrient standpoint, that's where the rooting action is. But the top six inches also dry out. So most crops will send roots down deeper in search of moisture. If they hit a, compact, a compacted layer, they're not going to be able to get down there. Cover crops, especially the uh, deep rooter ones, the tap rooted ones will break up that layer compaction. So our crops that we're interested in can get down into the subsoil and find that moisture. They also improve biopores. So this is really important for drainage on heavier soils, soils that have a lot of clay content in them. They will break through that tighter soil, the clay, and that'll improve drainage. And because the clay tends to be compacted and it's resistant to rooting, guess what? Now we have a natural rooting channel for those roots to go through. And roots are going to expend the moisture or the energy trying to break through compacted soil. When they find a drainage pore, a biopore, they're going to follow it right down. The next thing they do, and we've already talked about this, they stimulate biological activity, both by exuding the, uh, the exudates, so the carbon containing materials, but also when they die, when they're terminated or dying naturally, they tend to be physiologically really young. So there's not, they're not resistant to, to microbial decay. They break down rapidly and that further stimulates bacterial or biological activity. They also help to increase microbial diversity and abundance. So the abundance through this, um, through this adding carbon to the system, they help with the diversity and in particular, the mycorrhizal fungi by supporting their growth throughout the, uh, throughout the gardening calendar, not just when host plants are there, but when they themselves are hosts that are there, they will continue the infections and hopefully continue it until we can establish an infection with the next host plant are very valuable crops like tomatoes, for example, are shown to be really, really uh, mycorrhizal. So that's really important. Their decomposition improves um, aggregation. So they produce as a waste product, microbial gums that stick the primary particles together to form aggregates. aggregates. And they may, depending on the species, add organic matter. So if we have species that break down really rapidly that we want for carbon release or for the release of the nutrients, plant available nutrients that they have, they may not add a lot of organic matter. But if they're really high in uh, carbon and nitro nitrogen ratio, which means they're recalcitrant, some of that organic matter is not gonna break down and that's gonna add to staple organic matter, which is really valuable over time. Other benefits in the garden, 
pollinator and uh, beneficial insect habitat. Some of the species that I'm going to talk about tonight are perfect for pollinators. Buckwheat is a really good example. Uh, Facilia is another great example. So if you don't have pollinator on your hand on your on your land, you plant these things, you'll attract the pollinators in. And once they know to come to the garden, hey, let's do the work, the pollination work in 95% of the species that are already in the garden, but rely on, uh, on us, the insects, for pollination. They also suppress weeds through direct competition through their residue when they die, especially if, if you leave it on the soil surface. And some species have been demonstrated, at least in the lab, to be um, allelopathic. So they have the ability to chemically suppress the germination of other species. So we can use that to our advantage and reduce the amount of time that we spend hoeing. They can also disrupt uh, pest and disease cycles by spreading out the amount of time from a susceptible crop to another susceptible crop. And when we do that, that allows the soil microbes who we've stimulated to attack the residue, which is the source of the inoculant. The inoculant, like we talked about last time, if it is naked, if it's not housed in that residue, which is now decomposed, is further susceptible to the decomposing, decomposing microbes, so they will break it down. There's some other ones that are really ingenious in breaking pest cycles. So hairy vetch is a really good example, and this isn't a horticultural example, but it's um, an agronomic example. So for the longest time, it was rumored that, vast, that vetch was an alternate host for the soybean cyst nematode which is a devastating problem in soybean production. And it turns out that was based on some really bad science, which investigated further and found out that the vetch sends out chemical signals into the soil solution, very similar to what a soybean does. And so these cysts or these nematodes are in a cyst and that's a survival capsule. It's a way to think, an egg is the way to think of it. And so they simulate the breakdown of the egg and for the um, release of the juvenile nematodes into the soil solution, they come to the chemical signal that's being released by the vetch. Hey, they cannot establish the infection on the plant. They don't have a food source. They are obligate parasites. They need a host. They can't feed on stuff that's in solution. They die. So it reduces the inoculum. And then a really fun thing, some of these cover crops are edible. Best example is the forage radish pictured here, which we're gonna talk about later, and uh, soybeans, edible in the sense of edanami. Oh, I've noticed my native deer population is just tearing my beans apart right now. And I can't figure out the attraction other than the drought and the native species and the neighbor's hay fields are really non-productive right now. So next, let's start talking about management. But before we do that, let's talk about the take-home messages. So these are really things that I would put at the front of the talk, but I think they're really important up front because these are points to make that'll think you can think about cover crops as we talk about uh, individuals in a minute. So there's no such thing as a universal cover crop. So there are multiple uses and our species selection is gonna be based on our goal. Multiple benefits are possible in some situations. In science lingo, we call that multiple uh, multifunctionality, but that's kind of a rare thing. It's mutually exclusive in others. So we talked about building organic matter, but also legumes that are fixing nitrogen and we want to release to release that nitrogen to the next generation of crop plants. So if we want them to break down, if they break down really rapidly, there's not gonna be anything left to build organic matter. So nitrogen fixation and legumes are mutually exclusive with the goal of increasing soil organic matter. The next thing is there's no such thing as a perfect cover crops. All species have positives, and they all have negatives. So there's a few that come close. Winter rye, for an experienced user, comes really close in my mind. But um, in general, there's no such thing as a perfect. 
The next thing, experimentation and management is going to equal success. So in your garden situation, some of you I know have cover crop experience. You know what works, what doesn't. For you newbies, start small with new covers, gain experience, and then within your cover crop system, look for opportunity to exploit their properties. Maybe you want to plant it at a different time before a different crop, but experimentation is huge. And the last thing, and I say this about farmers, I say it about gardeners, there is a vast amount of gardener, indigenous gardener knowledge and experience out there that you can draw from to learn. So, and quite frankly, farmers, gardeners, they are leading us in academic academia. You guys know your stuff. You started this long before we did. Maybe not so much in gardening, but in farming. I mean, we we in academ academia recognize that farmers, because none of us were available to give the recommendations or the advice based on a lack of research data and experience, you went out and figured it out on your own. On your own. And uh, so a really good story to, to exemplify this. So I got really interested in cover crops for over 40 years ago. So before I started graduate school, I went to University of Wisconsin, Madison. I talked to a, an extension specialist and I said, hey, I'm interested in cover crops. This is why. So he gave me an extension publication. So this is 1988. He gave me an extension public club, an extension publication called Growing Legumes for Green and Nerves from 1973. So now it's already 14 years old. That extension publication from Wisconsin was based on data from experiments conducted in Iowa in the early 1950s. So that's how behind the times we were in 1988. Now that is not the case. It's, uh, academia has somewhat caught up, but still it's the farmers that are leading the charge. And you're really experienced gardeners like Melinda Myers, they're gonna tell you that, hey, there's a lot of good information out there, but talk to your fellow gardener. And I say that to farmers all the time, and I'm saying it to you now, the gardeners. So cover crops, so that's the wisdom on uh, cover crops. So cover crops are really a catch-all name and the use includes some very specific purposes. So soil conservation, soil improvement, nutrient cycling and management, green manuring, fixing nitrogen, pest suppression, and other uses like carbon um, sequestration. So we're gonna go through these quickly as a catalog and your intended cover crop use should direct your species selection. And that's really the reason I'm going through this catalog. So the first one is conservation. So our goal here is to protect the soil from wind and water erosion, and we're trying to prevent soil and nutrient movement from the garden. Our aim here in selecting species is to develop cover as rapidly as possible to protect the soil surface from raindrop impact. So desirable attributes in a cover crop, rapid germination and early growth. Spreading stature is ideal because if the cover crop spreads out, it's gonna protect against the raindrop impact versus one that's growing straight up in the air that doesn't have the canopy to protect the soil surface. And ideally be adapted to difficult situations and easy to establish. And what I'm really thinking about here is after the harvest, late season harvest of cool season um, vegetable crops, we're, we're running out of time folks. And so we may be tempted to, to throw seed out there just to get cover. And it turns out there are species that are really adapted to this, really easy to establish. Oats is the perfect example of that. It doesn't need much. It can deal with that kind of, kind of establishment environment. The next is, I can't read, soil improvement. So we're looking to improve soil physical structure and our aim as managers to add as much organic matter as possible, but also to break up the compacted soil like we talked about earlier on. Desirable attributes, we want high yield potential. So that's above ground biomass. We want as much as we can produce in a short amount of time as possible 
But in the case of my fail situation, you may be contributing your garden to the full season. And there, we don't really need rapid growth, but we want the high yield potential. We also want recalcitrant. So that's biomass that's resistant to decay because we don't want it all to break down to release the carbon and the nutrients. We want some of it to stick around to form stable organic matter. We want fibrous root systems to break up uh, plow layer compaction. When I say plow layer, not the not the layer, the plow layer at the bottom, but in that top six inches of soil, so the top soil, and then tap roots for deep compaction. You can't get that with one single species. So ideally, we're going to use a mix, which I'm going to pitch a little bit later. Again, I can't read the slide because my screen dashboard is up there. The next use, nutrient cycling. So we want to take nutrients that are in the soil and we want to store them in organic form and be able to release them back in a mineral form with the soil, with the soil life. So it's available for the next, um, next generation of crop plants. This is especially important in years like this where we have applied a lot of nutrients in a particular nutrients that can become water soluble, like nitrogen, like sulfur. We don't have sufficient rainfall unless you're watering for the crops to take those up. So they're sitting in the soil in a plant available form, but they're also in a water soluble form, which is available for leaching. So if we get a big rainfall, they can be lost. Same thing happened agronomically last year in our neighborhood. It's happening this year. There's a lot of nitrogen that's sitting out there. But I can tell you right now, the corn is not gonna take it up. So it's gonna be available for leaching later on. So we need some kind of cover crop to be able to take that nutrient after harvest and keep those nutrients and make them available for the next crop. So our aim is to have a species that acts as a sponge. It'll take up those available nutrients and keep them available for the next series, like I said, the next generation of crops. So desirable attributes in this kind of cover crop, rapid growth, because it's after harvest of the crop that left the nutrients behind, medium to high yield potential, degradable biomass. The reason that's important is we want those nutrients to be able to re be released back to the uh, system for the next generation crop, a deep root season, deep root system to uh, chase after nutrients that may have leached out of the crop rooting zone and high di nutrient demand. That's really important because if the crop needs a lot of nutrients to complete its life cycle, it's going to go after those deep nutrients. The next one is, is a green manure. So green manure and cover crop gets used uh, interchangeably really what green manuring means is nitrogen. So our goal is to add nitrogen, and this is a substitute for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So you may be using synthetic fertilizer in the garden. It really doesn't have that great an impact, but on a farming scale where we're talking about millions of acres a year where we apply synthetic fertilizer, we got to remember synthetic fertilizer is made out of finite resources, natural gas, and it takes a lot of energy to produce it. So if we can substitute that with biologically fixed nitrogen, we're going to re reduce our reliance on, on fossil fuel. So our aim here as managers is fix as much nitrogen as possible and then be able to release it effectively to the following crop. So the de desirable attributes in our cover crop, actually, a legume is a must. Other species can't fix it while we're learning that maybe they can, but not to the degree in quantity and in timing that a legume can produce in a very short order. We want a legume that's very competitive in a garden situation, so it will compete with weeds. We want medium to high yield potential. The reason for that is the higher the yield potential, the more nitrogen it has to fix to meet its yield potential. And then we want something with a degradable biomass that's going to break down really rapidly over time. And this is important because some legumes 
especially the perennial legumes, which I'm not going to recommend, but they tend to have much higher carbon to nitrogen ratios in their tissues. So they break down much slower than an annual legume, like a soybean crop that's in a vegetative form, not the fully mature residues, but in a vegetative form, or something like bursine clover or crimson clover. They're going to be much more vegetative, much lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. As soon as that residue hits the soil surface, the microbes are going to attack it and break down that nitrogen, the residues and release that nitrogen to the subsequent crop. The last goal is um, pest, reducing pest population. So our goal, or pest suppression. So our goal is to reduce, to control or reduce pest populations. There's a lot of ways we can do that with cover cropping. We can outcompete them, especially in the case of weeds. We can disrupt pest life cycles like we talked about with the nematodes, or we can reduce the inoculum available for susceptible crops. So cover crops aren't gonna do this directly, but by adding their young, easily um, digestible or degradable residues, we're going to increase the soil decomposers who will naturally break down the inoculum that's in the soil. So that's going to overall reduce the inoculum and produce what we talked about last time, the disease suppressing soil. So desirable attributes, attributes here, early germination and early growth, and that's particularly important for out-competing weeds, but then highly specific species and pest interactions like I talked about with the, uh, the hairy vetch triggering the cyst nematode to germinate, but that it can't in, um, initiate the, the infection and so it dies. So management considerations, this is the last section, but these are all important to think about before you even think about cover cropping, before seed even goes in the ground. How am I gonna terminate it? Will it winter kill? Is tillage enough? Will chemicals work alone? So these are kind of dual purpose slides. This is for the gardening audience, but also for the farming audience. For the Gardening audience, you're probably leaning towards organic. I do certainly in my own. I don't use um, synthetics with the exception of Roundup, but that's a glyphosate. That's a, that's a personal choice, but I do not use it where I'm going to be in close contact or association with um, growing vegetable crops. It's more um, a generation removed, so to speak, and I'll explain that later on. So winter killing, for sure, we're going to talk about that. Is tillage enough? You may need tillage to control your um, cover crop, or maybe not. Again, we're encouraging the elimination or the reduction in tillage. If you grow a cover crop, using tillage to kill it kind of defeats the purpose. How do I deal with escapes? Can it volunteer? The answer is yes. All annuals can potentially set seed. One that we're going to talk about, buckweed set seed. It's 60 days from seed to seed. So your goal as manager is to prevent it from setting that seed. The other question is, can it get too big for my equipment? And I'm thinking particularly in the case of mowing. Some of the cover crops can grow tremendously. We control them by mowing. You gotta be really careful. With a push mower, you can manage them, but it can get to the point where you can't use your push mower. You may need to use a rider mower or spe more specialty equipment that you may have, may not have, like a three-point mounted brush hog. So that's something to think about with the situation you've got. What about pest interactions? Can it be an alternate host for disease? So the brassic has come up here. Forage radish potentially is a disease host, an alternate host for other disease or other crops that you grow in the garden. The brassica species, the cabbages, the uh, Brussels sprouts, that kind of thing. So that's something to think about in selecting a site or where you put it in rotation with your with your garden crops. Is it an alter, alt, can it attract insect pests in my other crops? Mostly the ones that I'm gonna talk about, the answer is no, but one in particular, the answer is yes. I will talk about it when we talk about that species. And I'll tell you right now, it's buckwheat uh, when we talk about that crop in particular. And how can it affect the following crop? Can the residue tie of nitrogen? 
we talked about crops to build soil organic matter, the ones that have the re re recalcitrant residue, the ones that are slow to decay, the summer mixes, the sorghum, sorghum to sedans, that's really important. They can tie up residue that you may apply for a subsequent crop, a high nitrogen demand crop like tomatoes, sweet corn, or um, vine crops like the melons, the pumpkins. So that's something to think about. And if so, respond from a management standpoint accordingly by applying additional nitrogen to those crops. Will the residue interfere with tillage equipment? If that's the case, um, think about how to manage it and maybe terminate it earlier. Will it deplete soil moisture? A huge consideration this year. If you're growing it after your crop, if you're growing the cover crop after your garden crop, probably not so much a consideration. But if you're like me and you planted the cover crop before the garden crop, big mistake this year. And I'll talk about what I did. And is it alle allelopathic? We don't really know which cover crops produce allelopathy other than winter rye. Um, we know that that tends to target the larger seeded species with the exception of soybeans, or excuse me, it targets the smaller seeded. So the larger seeded species with the exception of corn are really immune to allelopathy. So we don't know about it. Um, rye in particular in the garden, um, I wouldn't grow it so that it's green growing before um, before garden species, vegetable species, I would grow it afterwards without, without hesitation if you can manage the residues. But that's just something to consider. Is tillage required for establishment? Remember, we're growing these things to improve our soil. Presumably, that's your number one goal, to improve soil. If you have to till the soil to uh, establish it, you may make the soil more prone to erosion, you're going to burn up organic matter. And so you're really kind of potentially defeating the purpose. Are conditions suitable for excess? This is a key question to ask now. I'm asking myself this one right now. Is there for sufficient germination in the soil, moisture in the soil for germination? I'm saying no, I'm holding for now. Is there sufficient time for growth? It's June 13th. We have plenty of time. We haven't even reached the toggle point for switching from warm season to cool. So we have plenty of time for warm season, for cool season. Right now, the driver is the moisture. And then is a warm or a cool season species more appropriate? We still have a month at least for planting warm season species. So that's really not a question. But you get later on, you get into mid-August, then yeah, you need to start thinking about cool season species. And then lastly, management consideration. How am I going to plant it? Can I get good soil seed contact? Just flinging the seed out there, um, in which case residue seed contact, that may be enough, or do I have to put it into the ground, which means that I need equipment, or can I just fling it out on the ground and rake it in? Is that enough? And then the question of double splitting, I'm going to talk about that with uh, seeding methods. So I've used up about a half of my time. Um, one last slide before we get to a break and take questions, life cycle. So where these become important as when we're thinking about management. So the life cycles for cover crops we wanna think about are annuals, winter annuals, or biannuals. Do not use perennials as a cover crop, except where you want maybe a living mulch like in pads. That's okay. You can have living mulch in foot pads, um, the reason we say this, they are difficult to terminate ultimately, but they will tolerate mowing. A lot of the species will tolerate mowing and will tolerate foot traffic. So you wanna keep green growing in the soil for soil health reasons, uh, perennials there, but not in the rest of the garden. So why is life cycle important? It tells you how and when the growth is gonna occur 
and when you're going to get dry matter accumulation. So with an annual, its job is to reproduce this year. It's going to grow like crazy. So you're going to get a lot of growth in the first year. That's not like the winter annuals or the biennials that we may use for cover crops. They're going to grow a little bit the first year, then they're going to stall out. They're waiting for envi environmental cues to tell them, hey, it's winter, it's cold now, you wait, you resume that, you resume that really rapid growth the next year, and that's when you can reproduce. So that's when the majority of growth occurs with, an, with winter annuals and biennials, that's in the next year. So that also tells you when it should be terminated. So annuals, you wanna terminate before they set seed, you wanna terminate them before, or after they set flower, if you, if you terminate them before they set flower, they're gonna regrow. So that also tells you how you can terminate them. You can cut them after they flower to terminate them. If you cut them before they flower, they'll simply regrow re back, re back. So that's a way to manage the cover crop. And then finally, the manipulation. So planning out a season. What happens this time of year if you plant winter rye? It'll germinate, it'll grow, but then it's gonna stall out. It's gonna stall out waiting for that cold snap to tell me that it, it's winter, so now I can shift into reproductive growth. When it stalls out, what happens? The diseases, the rust diseases that blow in from down south, they will attack it and basically it'll decay away. Why I'm recommending this as a potential cover crop management strategy is you can plant it, you all know winter rye grows really rapidly. You can get cover crop or you can get cover residue very rapidly to establish slower growing species. It'll stall out and then the slower growing species will grow through it and you protected them without having to do a, a lot of weeding. And I wish I had way more time to talk about this, but maybe we can talk about it during discussion at the end. All right, it's time for the break. Joanne, are there questions queued up. All right. So uh, is there a handout or a takeaway um, that you can provide which reviews cover crops and the benefits and drawbacks? So that's a question for you, Joanna. You want to talk about how this will be distributed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so we will send all of this out afterwards. I know Jim had some recommended reading listed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and then afterwards, probably tomorrow, the video will be uploaded into YouTube. And um, we will also share all of Jim's slides. So. All right, so the question is, you were talking a lot about growing and mowing of the cover crops, Jim, but what about raised beds? Yeah, so raised beds are a problem. And unless you want to lift the mower up there, forget it, you're not going to be able to mow it. And the other point is, why are you raising, why are you growing in raised beds? It may be to avoid, avoid soil physical problems like a lot of clay in the subsoil. So you just increase the elevation for drainage, um, but also presumably to avoid traffic. So you don't want any traffic and that includes pushing tools across it. So in the case of mowing, um, you could potentially use something like a hedge clipper or some kind of cutting instrument. Otherwise, instead of mowing, I would wait until the cover crop flowers and then I'd pull them. So raised beds, again, presumably it's a small enough area that pulling it's not gonna be really detrimental. The other thing, pulling versus, it's a lot more work than mowing, but the other thing is with the mowing, there's always the potential, and I'm gonna show you this, the potential that even though the textbook says it's flowered, mow it now, it's gonna kill it, that doesn't always happen. With pulling, you almost always get it. And the, the, the guarantee with that comes from the fact that most of the species, in fact, all the species that we recommend for cover crops do not form adventitious roots. So if you pull them and you'll see later, I recommend do it on a sunny, hot day. Why so the plants dry out? What happens when you pull purslane? I can hear the group from there, even though everyone's on mute. 
what happens with purslane, even if it's a hot, hot, drying day, it's going to root itself again. Why? Purslane has adventitious roots. You look at each of those nodes on the stem, there's little, little hair-like things sticking out. Those aren't whiskers. Those are adventitious roots. So it, it loses its transpiration stream from the roots, the water coming in. Those things go down in the ground and right away, boom, it's rooted and growing like crazy. Like you never pulled it out. The recommendation for them, put it in a bucket and take them to the compost pile. Get those things out of the garden. I know my garden is full of them. What slows them down is if you start harvesting to eat and if you harvest them when they're really young and tasty. So this is, this is Shea Jimmy speaking, a little bit of uh, balsamic vinegar on it. They are awesome. But when they get older, they tend to get tougher. So throw those in the in the compost pile. Okay, great. So um, two more questions, and then uh, we'll let you move on. Can you repeat one more time what you said about cutting before flower or during flower? Okay, so annuals, their job, well, all plants, all species for that matter, our job is to reproduce. So in the annual plants, their job is to reproduce. They don't wait around for vernalization to grow the next year. They get after it right now. So they grow, they have the phase of growth called vegetation, vegetative growth. That's when they put all their biomass into vegetation. They get a signal that it's time to reproduce. And so they shift from vegetative growth into reproductive growth. So, and this can get a little complicated, but um, just as a, a simplification, they make that shift, they start into reproductive growth. If you cut them, then they're not gonna go back to reproductive growth. So the plan is done, it's game over. There are exceptions though, some species, even if you cut them low, will still, even though the growing point is way up in the air, they will still regrow. And that's from uh, basal buds that are at ground level. So that's a problem, a problem. Some species will, when you regrow, if they have indeterminate growth, if you cut them, they will regrow. And what indeterminate means is they keep growing vegetatively while they're flowering. But just in general, if you cut them before they flower, they will keep growing. If you cut them after the flower, it'll kill them. The reason we cut them before flowering, if we want to manage the biomass, is they will keep growing, but that cutting gives us a chance to manage the growth so it doesn't get so big that we can't, we can't manage it with the mowing equipment we had. So I'm gonna show a picture of buckwheat that I mowed um, in my garden. These pictures are from last year. I, growed it, I grew it early because I knew it would get too big for my push mower to handle and I didn't wanna work that hard. So I caught them when they got up so high. I mowed them hoping they would regrow. Turns out they didn't like the mowing even though they weren't all flowering and it pretty much put an end to them because they were, some of them were flowering. Clear as mud, right? Yeah. All right, and then one more. All right, and any questions you guys have raised about specific cover crops, I'm gonna leave to the end because um, Jim's gonna cover specifics next, next and he may answer some of these questions. But the next question, and you always increase my vocabulary, Jim, is what is allelopathic? Don't know if I said that right. Alleopathic. How do you say that? Allelopathy, it's a lot easier to pronounce than to spell. Okay. And I'm not sure, and I'm working with that scientifically on one of my projects right now. Um, and I'm not sure I spell it right. So, and spell check doesn't always get it right either. <laughs> so I always Google it on my cell phone. So allelopath, allelopathy is chemical warfare from one plant species to another. So what the allelopathic species do is exude natural herbicides into the soil solution that either one, prevent the germination of another species or number two, prevent it to, from germinating. 
So it's been worked out in the laboratory, demonstrated in the laboratory in rye. Um, some of the species you may be familiar with, although one of them has gotten really controversial lately, and that is the black walnut and the compound called juglone. Some people pronounce it juglone. I call it juglone and garden species. So you've all heard that, right? I'm seeing nodding from the one head that I can, the two heads that I can see. Yeah, well, I think it was Melinda Myers who just said last time she was on Garden Talk with Larry Mueller, maybe not so much anymore. I'm still scared to death of it. I'm not fortunate enough to have um, walnuts on my, at least on my homestead. Um, turns out I got some in my woods. I don't know where they're coming from. But anyway, I don't have it near my garden, so I don't worry about it. But from the gardeners that I always talk to in Master Gardener training, they're always like, yeah, that's a huge concern. That is allelopathy. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to let you move on now. So thank you so much, Jim.